So welcome to preparing your landscape for spring. I know everybody is looking at the big rock in the middle, but before we dive into preparing our landscape for spring, let's think about what defines a landscape and what it means to us. Maybe your version is a nice little niche to sit down for inspiration where you collect art, or maybe it's more formal. Maybe it's your beautiful front yard that you have beautiful trees growing in a nice lawn, or maybe it's your back or side yard where you grow your vegetables and your flowers. We can all agree that it's not static like this well-placed specimen boulder. Your landscape is your garden, and our gardens evolve and change from season to season and year after year. In January and in February, we have the perfect opportunity to survey our landscape. The absence of our leaves and weeds gives us an unobstructed view of what lies uh, in, around, underneath our plants. So bundle up and walk your property. Look for damage, look for invaders, look for tools you misplaced. Take a notebook with you and jot down your finds and the things you want to get around to doing. My favorite is to go outside at around 4.15 in the p.m. and enjoy the, settings, the setting sun. Now you'll be on the west side of your house. So get out your notebook and sketch your property noting north, south, east, and west. The winter sunset and the summer sunset do step, uh, differ slightly, but you're going to have a general idea of what side your house faces west, which is very convenient when you plant flowers and trees and shrubs that say prefers a eastern exposure, prefers a southern exposure. So that's always nice to know how your property lays. Well, I discovered these lovelies on a walk of my property two weeks ago. I didn't recognize all of them, so I took pictures and used the Seek app. Now, I've noted the Seek app in the resource sections of the handouts. So the pretty orange berries on the left, which I've never seen before, is an oriental bittersweet vine. After looking it up, I found out that it's highly invasive and it needs to be removed as soon as possible. Below that is a multiflora rose. Now I've seen those before, but never in this spot. Now the multiflora rose is another invasive. It spreads, it spreads, it spreads, it can grow to 20 feet. That needs to come out. As I walked around my front yard, there was a little patch of weeds in the lawn. And as I looked at them, I noticed the darn thing was going to seed. Setting out, this was two weeks ago. And I noticed it had little yellow flowers. So I need to dig those out. Then in my backyard near my apple tree, I saw these little, what I thought white berries. But after using the Seek app, I found out that they're actually an insect called wax scale. So all of these need to be removed as soon as possible. And I think I'm going to have to do a second inspection. So walk your property, get your little notebook out, write down what you see, and that way you remember what you need to do. Now for the age old question, do we clean up or do we just tidy up? Well. When you clean away all remnants of last year's landscape, you remove the habitat of many overwintering insects, both the good insects and the bad insects. And it is this diversity that makes for a flourishing and balanced landscape. So you can see I'm leaning towards tidier. The perennial stems that are still standing are markers that show you where not to step. They're hollow stems if left in place, may host this year's native bee larva. So when the perennials do start to grow, you can trim the old stems back 
about eight to 12 inches and just leave them. Why? Because the new growth is going to hide them. If you have fruit trees, you should remove and throw away any debris near the trunk to prevent overwintering pathogens from reinfecting your trees. Now try to tidy up, not clear away every trace of last year's growth. Start a spot in your yard where you could pile up twigs and small branches for the birds to take shelter in. Now is the time to start planning and deciding what you want to grow. Again, get your notebook out, or should we just start calling it your garden log? And go through cat garden catalogs for inspiration. But if you have no catalogs, you can use the internet to find online catalogs. And remember to look for the sections on the websites that contain information on how to plant, how to start seeds, information on growing vegetables. You could also look to the big box stores because they offer large selections of flower and vegetable seeds and growing media. In fact, just about anything you can buy online, but are unlike online purchasing, the store shelves don't remain stocked with seasonal material, so get it while you can. And most importantly, most importantly, if you have never had your soil tested, you should do it this year. It may be perfectly fine and need no amendments, but knowing is better than guessing and wasting money on chemicals you don't need. I included the link to the University of Delaware Soil Testing Lab in the resources section of the handout. Don't look so shocked. You can start seeds in the winter. Haven't you ever had a flower or a vegetable pop up somewhere in the landscape unexpectedly in the spring? Well, that's what we call a volunteer. The downside to sowing seeds in winter soil is that the seeds that you planted germinate right along with the weeds and it's very hard to tell which is which. If you do try winter sowing, use a plastic jug. Here they are. It's like a mini greenhouse, but be careful. You don't plant more than you can handle after they germinate. Seedlings are like baskets of kittens and puppies. You want them all, but they grow up fast and will need to be moved to larger pots before they go into the garden. So. Do you have the room and the time to care for many, many plants? It's convenient to put these all in the ground, but in a couple of months, you're going to have to decide what to do with all these seedlings and the resources to put them in. So consider that. Now we haven't had that much, but you should plan for snow. And if it snows that heavy, wet type of snow, that drags down trees and shrub branches, bundle up and grab a broom. You should have an outside broom to dust off the heavy snow before it breaks or damages your limbs. You start at the bottom and you use the soft broom bristles to shake away the snow. You do this several times until you have shaken off all of the snow. Do not start at the top because the falling snow is going to add more heavy weight to the lower limbs. Now, if you get that, if it does snow like this this year and you can't get around to it right away, if it snows overnight or if it snows during the day and when you come home from work, you see this, go out and remove it. But don't be shocked if the tree or the shrub stays bent, it will eventually spring back. It's also the right time in January and February to inspect your tools, all of them, your shovels, your rakes, your pitchforks, your loppers, your hand tools, or any of them left outside, they're gonna need some extra tender loving care. 
Note which ones are broken or weakened and may need to be replaced. You remove rust with a wire brush or steel wool and use a general type of sandpaper on your splintery wood handles of your shovels and your rakes. Your, your tools also probably need to be sharpened. You should look to buy a sharpener that you can put in your pocket and carry with you as you tend your landscape. Then after you clean the metal and the wood surfaces, you can finish off by wiping them down with an old rag and some mineral oil and just wipe down the metal and the wood surfaces. The metal will keep the, on the metal, it'll keep it from further rust. And of course it will make the wood handles uh, less prone to splintering in the future. Okay, now it's time to round up and clean your pots. So I just wanna say you never save a pot from a diseased plant without scrubbing and disinfecting first, or you could just throw it all away. But if it's a pot you cherish and you wanna keep, make sure you do a good job in disinfecting it. So gather up all your empty pots or as many as you think you're going to need and you remove all the old soil. And if any pots have any stuck on debris, you can soak the pot in water overnight. So you could either wash them with soap and water and then of course rinse them. If you think there's no danger of lingering pathogens and if you want to disinfect them, and you fill a bucket with nine pots water to one pot household bleach. Uh, this is called a 10% solution. You dunk the pot in the solution and wash it with a cloth or a brush. And then you set the pot out to dry. No rinsing is required. And remember, you're working with bleach, so use rubber gloves and wear old clothes. And now for everybody's favorite, or maybe it's just mine, it's time to prune. Pruning is sometimes optional and sometimes mandatory. Here are three examples of what you will find in your landscape now. Here is a broken stem. You must prune that off. Do not leave that hanging there. You could see it ripped a little bit, and you take it off because if you leave it on, it's just going to whip around in the wind, damaging the rest of the tree. So that's a must. On the top right, I don't know if you've ever seen a pawpaw tree, but they colonize. They colonize by sending up suckers and you find them in the forest. And my backyard is not a forest. So I'm going to remove all these suckers. They're not seedlings. They come up off of the root, so they will be removed. And then the other type of pruning is pruning out large overgrown shrubs. This is a beautiful viburnum that has hundreds of blooms in the springtime. And I think, I think this year it's going to get pruned just to open it up, give it a little more sunlight, give it a little bit more air circulation. And I'm going to begin with pruning out the old wood. The new wood is light and silvery. And if you could see deep down, which you really can't, the old wood is darker. Those are three examples of why you might want to prune now. So pruning in general, why do we prune? Well, we prune to remove, like I said, dead plant material, twigs and limbs. We also improve, prune, and this is optional, to encourage a plant to grow bushy or tall. We also prune to correct our mistakes, like planting too close to the house. <laughs> when do we prune? Well, I can definitely say we never prune in the fall. Never prune in the fall. Why? Right, because pruning stimulates the plant to grow new buds. At a time, the plant is going dormant. So you're 
plant is going to sleep and you're pruning it and telling it, hey, grow some more twigs. No, pruning trees also creates a wound. Now, the wound is naturally healed by the tree itself. And the fall does not allow the tree the time to properly heal over the wound. Why? Because it's going dormant and not focused on producing new tissue. We prune now in the late winter, early spring, because a wound is less likely to be infected by insects and fungus because they're not out now. Late winter and early spring periods are periods of growth and it's the most desirable time to prune. Pruning also involves you making contact with the plant and reaching into the plant. So there's less danger of damaging an unswollen leaf bud at this time. That means you're not going to knock off the upcoming season's leaves and flowers. So you could see in this lower left right hand side this has leaf buds. You could see the difference between this leaf bud and this leaf bud. This one is flat, pressed against the stem. If you were to accidentally brush against that, you're not going to knock it off. But as the season progresses, they're going to start to begin to look more and more like the one here that I'm pointing at that's more swollen. So if you're not mindful, you could knock off what you really want to be growing on your plant. So be careful. And remember that storm or wind damaged branches can be removed any time of year because the safety of people and the safety of your property is your first concern. And I know last year we had some crazy wind damage here in Delaware and uh, I'm sure it's all gone by now. <clears throat> so just continuing with pruning, let's talk about pruning trees. Okay, on the left-hand side, I have two examples of trees. Of course, the one on the top is a very young tree and you could see that its branches are relatively thin compared to the tree below it. And if you were to prune the tree on the top, you could use a hand loppers for it. But a tree that cannot be cut with the lopper is, remove, is removed. So let's look, for example, at this tree here. You cut it in three steps. The first step is you come out about three inches from the trunk and you make your first cut and you cut up halfway through, do not cut the limb off. The second cut, you approach from the top and you come about four inches out. And this one you cut all the way through and you allow the branch safely to fall to the ground. What you're left with is the stub. Now look at the stub. Pretend that there's a stub here. Do you notice the collar? The collar is that point where it's not exactly the branch and it's not exactly the trunk. It's this area here. You never cut the collar. You may cut close to it and near it, but you never cut it. So your third cut is smooth and precise and you remove the stub close to the collar. Here's an example of a tree limb that was removed and you can clearly see the collar was left intact. You want it to be very conservative and careful. You could leave a little bit more of the collar. This person left no collar and it created a sunken look. This tree, this tree might've been damaged. It might've been pruned in the fall and never properly healed over and it was in fact attacked by bugs and the bugs of course attract birds and so it's not a healthy looking tree. 
you always observe the trunk collar rule, even when pruning with loppers and hand pruners. So you don't prune, you don't cut flush to the tree. You leave a little bit of the collar left. That's how the tree will heal properly. You're very quiet, so I'll just keep going then. Now we're going to come to shrubs. Shrubs are usually pruned to maintain. I yeah. Have a question on those last cuts, <clears throat> if we're allowed to ask one. Go right ahead. Well, you made a first cut um, halfway up uh, from the bottom on the left bottom picture. And I'm not clear as to why you did that. Okay. Speaking from experience, because you would know this if you ever did what I did the first time. When you cut a large branch off and your initial attack would be to, let me just take the chainsaw or the saw or whatever and start cutting here, this way. Now, if you had a Jedi sword and you could just laser it right off, it would be no problem. But even if you're using a power tool, there is a factor of time that's involved between coming through the entire, um, in the entire branch. You start at the top and you eventually get to the bottom. Well, sometime during eventually, when you're about halfway to quarter quarter of the way through the weight. Now what you don't see is that whole branch that's coming out and maybe even going beyond the screen. The weight of that is going to rip it. And you're going to have a big tear. It might even rip down into the trunk and you got a, a bigger problem than just removing your branch. So by making an undercut first and then cutting this way, when you get to halfway to three quarters of the way, if it's going to rip or tear, you've already made this cut and it's gonna fall away without damaging the rest of your tree. Do you follow? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Now this is what we mostly do have uh, in our landscape are shrubs. So shrubs are usually pruned to maintain a certain size or shape, meaning the pruning of shrubs is a little bit more elective than pruning trees. There's a lot of information on the internet showing how to cut at the correct angle above the leaf node. And as I had already mentioned, this is a leaf node. If you have a lot of pruning to do, you will not be checking to see that every cut is at a 45 degree angle. Just be aware, if you don't cut straight across flat or cut it at such a pointy angle and always leave a little bit of stem above the leaf node. Okay, for your older shrubs, a good place to start is at the bottom. You look for the oldest looking stems and you cut them out and you leave a stub about maybe two inches at the bottom. You also remove any stems that rub against one another. And this is a kind of like a universal rule. You do it for trees, you do it for shrubs. You have two stems or two branches that are rubbing against one another. You have to cut one out. By leaving them, you open up the plant to damage and maybe even insect or some kind of pathogen can get in there, fungus or virus. So no rubbing, you cut one out. So you really want to open up a shrub for increased light and air circulation. You prune for shape and symmetry, and you, uh, you look to see where 
your nodes are oriented because that is going to tell you where your new leaf or branch is going to sprout. So if you have a shrub that had a little wind, uh, winter damage and it's kind of got a, a bald or a bare spot on the right, when you prune it in the spring, you make sure the leaf node that you leave is on the right side because it will grow in that direction and fill it in. This is how we influence the shape of our shrubs. Now, not to say that you cannot um, do your pruning in May and June, but imagine if these were all loaded up with leaves. It's, it's harder to see what you're cutting when your shrub is all leafed out, okay? So, further, further ways of influencing the shape of your shrubs. If you cut off the tips of the branches, you will encourage the growth of the side shoots and thereby you'll achieve a more bushy and thicker shrub, a more filled in look. If you want your shrubs to be taller and leaner, you'll make the cuts at the base and that way you'll encourage some basal growth. So, how much pruning is too much pruning? We follow the one third rule, which says you don't remove more than one third of good wood during a major pruning session. You can always come back later and make a few corrective cuts. Maybe that's when you do uh, come back in May or June and say, oh, look at this one branch sticking out over here. I should have cut that. Well, you can cut it. You can cut in May and June. Okay, Rebecca, we have three pruning questions. Do you want yes. to or later? Okay. Go ahead. How do you prune for Scythia? There is a lot of overlapping branches. Okay. Well, if you want to have a natural look, and because that's I used to have a Scythia, and I liked it when it just got tall and it spilt over. Um, I was pruning that every year. Actually, I pruned it to death, and I really didn't want it. <laughs> um, for Scythias, I would start with the old wood, <clears throat> the much thicker old wood. And you know when for Scythias, um get pendulous and they uh, bend over and they touch the ground, they'll root. So if you don't want more for Scythias, I would keep them from touching the ground and touch there. So you, you would just prune out older growth. If it's very, if it is touching a lot, then um, cut some of them out. You, I mean, if, if it's just a wild hairy mess, do you want to trim out everyone that touches? You don't have to, if you do, you'll wind up with a very sparse looking Pasithia. So okay. decide what, decide, you have it in your head what you want it to look like first. So you're pretty flexible with Pasithias. Okay, the next question is also very specific and the best way to prune a crepe myrtle. Oh, crepe myrtles. Um, I have a neighbor next to me that never, ever, ever touches his crepe myrtle. Hmm. Never, wow. never, ever, 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 ever. Never once did I ever see him out there. And they're beautiful and they're tall. So why do you want to prune your crepe myrtle? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I have about eight of them and I don't want them to get large. I don't want them any higher than let's say 10 feet at the most. I don't want them to get gigantic. I live in Middletown and they planted crepe myrtles on the sidewalk as a sidewalk tree. And every year they plant, they, they prune them down to their nubs. They leave the stems and they leave just a few little branches 
and every year they come at, back looking beautiful. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Same that's thing. How, yeah, that's, you know, when, when you say, I don't want them to grow more than 10 feet. Well, if you planted a tree or shrub that does grow more than 10 feet, then you know you're going to have to prune often. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> so you're doing the right thing. Yes. If your shrub blooms, you need to know if it produces blooms on new growth or old growth. Do you know how to tell if it does? You look it up. This is where you document in your garden log, I have a hydrangea and it blooms in the summer. I have a, it blooms in the spring. That's part one. Part two is shrubs that bloom on new growth. Now new growth is growth that's going to happen in the spring should be pruned now in the winter, in the early spring. Shrubs that bloom on old growth, that's growth from the previous year, that's already there, they should be pruned in the late spring or summer after the flower fades, but before the flower falls off. What you do is you get your pointiest cutters and you go up to that spent bloom and you bend it back and you look and you will see where the next year's bud is already starting to grow and you cut off the spent bloom carefully without disturbing that future bud. Now I have hydrangeas and I never, I mean, it's just a little old thing out exposed and it really doesn't get much bigger every year. And I never cut, I never cut off the spent blooms they eventually fall off and they become little hydrangea tumbleweeds growing, flow, you know, rolling across my landscape. You prune off the old spent blooms because it saves you from cleaning them up later. Now, does your shrub bloom on new wood or old wood? You need to know that especially if it's a new shrub. I mean, if you have an old, 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 big old shrub that blooms on old wood and it, you, you say, well, Rebecca, I, I, it's just too big. Well, you're gonna have to cut some of those stems out and maybe not get as many blooms the following year, but it will eventually send up some uh, new stems the year after you prune it, and then the following year you'll get blooms on them. Questions? Yep, two more on pruning. One is about pruning evergreens. How do you prune an evergreen? Ah, I had a beautiful white pine. When I lived in New Jersey, I had my, an uncle. I'm sure he dug it up somewhere and just gave it to me. And I wanted it to get big and boy, did it get big and, and bushy because white pines don't really get all that bushy. In the spring, they send out candles. That's what they call them. The tips, you'll see new growth and they usually stand upright. If you take your pruners and you're gonna have to need a little alcohol because you'll get some sap, I'm sure. And you, you, um, Take, you take that branch at the, at the tip. You don't cut the candles off. You kind of like cut them in half. It's sort of like what we call tipping a plant. When you tip a plant, it gets bushier. Now, cutting off actual branches of, a, um, of an evergreen is sort of everybody has that Christmas tree in their uh, in their mind when they think of an evergreen from top to the bottom all nice beautiful branches you you would you would cut a limb off if it was diseased you know it's not going to grow back 
or if your uh, uh, tree is growing so close to all the other trees that you planted at the same time when they were small, you might want to limb it up a little bit so you could mow under it. Those are the real reasons to prune an evergreen. I have what I think is a juniper bush, which is taking over the front yard. It probably should be cut in half at least. Is it okay to do that? And when? Oh, now, absolutely now. If you have a sprawling juniper, what you could do is follow, you know, look to see where it's thickest and follow it back and maybe cut one or two or three out at the trunk and then prune the rest to stay in the bounds that you want, okay? I used to have a uh, garden railroad and, um, well, my husband had it in the garden and we planted all little Alberta spruces and things like that. And every year I would just prune everything almost down to the nub and every year he would say, you're killing everything. I say, well, wait a month, wait a month. And it, when it grows back and it covers all the cuts, you never see it. Okay, Rebecca, I think pruning could easily take over the rest of your presentation. So you might want to move on to give yourself okay. time to finish. And then we can circle back at the end if there's extra time. Okay. Carrie's posting some good links for people too. Thank you, Carrie. So pruning is, pruning again is elective except for diseased and damaged wood, okay? All the other pruning you do is to achieve something. So have that in your mind, what you want to achieve. Don't cut more than a third off. And if you're a little afraid, you don't know what a third is, come back later. I love to prune and walk around and around. I feel like Michelangelo carving out the David when I prune. I just look and look and picture in my mind, how is it gonna look when it leaves out? Never prune on a wet day. Wet day is the day you transmit pathogens humid days from your cutter to your leaf. In fact, you should carry a spray bottle of rubbing alcohol of 10% bleach solution of alcohol or 10% bleach solution and spray your cutters in between trimmings. And to keep your blades free of sap, you can use um, alcohol to loosen the sap. And here are the tools that you use, which I'm sure you're cut is your loppers. Here's a lopper on an extension. I just like to say a couple of words about the pruning saw. It is very sharp. It cuts on the pull. And unlike a wood saw that you might have in your shed, which cuts when you push, this cuts when you pull. So it's a little easier. And as you can see from the shape, it's made to go into tight spaces. March. Let's start March by talking about a couple of tools. The jeweler's loop, which is this, and of course the magnifying glass. Okay. We use them to check plants and seeds for insects and diseases. Now, to use either of them properly and to see up close, you need to hold them as comfortably close to your eye as possible keeping them stationary as you move the object you want to see back and forth to get it in focus. That's the proper way to use these. Also, if you have any saved seed, you have to check it out and make sure you don't see any tiny holes in the seeds, which signals insect damage. If you find any, throw it away. Now we come to horticultural oil, which is also called dormant oil, which is also called superior oil. Horticultural oils 
can be used to control a wide variety of insect pests. And the list is impressive. Adelgids, which I had to look that up. And those are those little fuzzy white, uh, you, you, you wouldn't think they were insects until you went to see what's that and it jumped away. Yeah, they kill those. Aphids, caterpillar eggs, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, mites, scales, spider mites, thrips, and white flies. <coughs> it works by suffocating some insects and disrupts the metabolism of other insect eggs, causing them all to starve. To it can also suppress the spread of viruses and fungal diseases by controlling the insect, that's the vector of the fungus or the virus, what you have to do is make sure you spray the insects. And for fungal diseases, you spray and coat both sides of the plant foliage, making sure to spray areas that are already damaged because it's necessary be for the oil to trap the spores and isolate the fungus to the infected areas. It's like putting a Band-Aid on it. All this needs to happen on a clear, dry day that's at least 40 degrees. And ideally, the buds are swollen, but they haven't opened. And there are OMRI brands approved for organic gardening. Horticultural oil is safe when used according to label instructions, but never use horticultural oil if you have used any product that had contained sulfur within the last 30 days, or you're going to do harm to your plant. Um, there's a question here about hort oil that probably a lot of people have, and that is, well, um, the horticultural oils work on spatter, spotted lanternfly egg cases. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I have never heard that referred to before either. Maybe we can find an answer later and send it out to folks. I think, I think, I mean, Pennsylvania has uh, put out a lot of information about spotted lanternfly, and I've read a lot of it and I've not seen anything for horticultural oil. Yep, same here. It's pro they're probably like in a cocoon and it won't penetrate. So best to I'll you know if it does, we'll get back to you and let you know it does, but I do not think it does for the reason that the eggs are in a hard case. Okay, bag worms. Thredopterus ephemerae formis. If you saw these on your landscape inspections, they need to be removed as soon as you have a chance. Do not pull on them or you will damage your tree or shrub. The silk that attaches them is very strong and can girdle a twig. I once saw these on a stop sign. The infestation must have been massive in the area. You could see how they attach. You can see the brown hair of the twig and then you can see the little white of the silk and then further down more white of the silk. If you were to yank on these, you would probably rip that twig off. So get a sharp scissors or a sharp pruner and cut them off, but do not throw them on the ground. You should put them in a bag and throw them away and maybe squash them first before you do. There is nothing you can do about the bagworm except to hand pick them off this time of year. So you couldn't spray horticulture oil on them. It'll do nothing to them. Bagworms feed over on over 50 families of deciduous and evergreen trees and shrubs. And some of the uh, infestations can cause damage to how the tree looks and also affect the health of the tree or shrub. They especially like junipers and arborvitae. In fact, that's basically what you always see them on are the arborvitaes. 
So at this time of year, they're all snuggled in their little bags maturing, and they're going to hatch around June, maybe late July, um, maybe May. When exactly, no one knows. But you may want to leave one bag on your plant and begin to check it in late May to see when it actually does hatch. But if there are bag worms that are out of your reach, your next opportunity to eliminate this pest is when they emerge from their bags. You could also consider planting the many members of the aster family, such as the large leaf aster or bee balm. These flowers attract a parasitic wasp that will kill the bagworm. Actually, the aster family flowers attract many parasitic wasps that kill many of your garden pests. So they're a good plant to add to your integrative pest management plan in your backyard. So one bag can have as many as 300 eggs. Well, on second thought, if you left the bag to act as an indicator for when it hatches, maybe you want to tie one of those gauzy, small drawstring bags around it to catch the little buggers when they hatch. The newly hatched caterpillars, they spin silken strands that are either caught up by the wind and disperse them throughout your whole landscape, or they get wrapped around tree branches. They begin to create their small silken shelters. They weave together bits of foliage and they begin forming their bag, which they enlarge as they get larger. So at this point, the safest control for them is Bacillus thuringiensis, the strain Kirstaki, or BTK. BTK is a bacterium that is naturally found in the soil. It is safe unless you belong to the family of Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and skippers and moths. So while it will not harm anything else but Lepidoptera, you do not want to spray where you have not observed bagworms. Why? Because you don't want to kill any other Lepidoptera. Why? Because the birds that are feeding their young feed them exclusively on caterpillars, pillars, while you're, the birds will take the seeds from your feeders, they do not feed the seed to their young, only caterpillars. So BTK will kill butterflies, moths, and skippers. So if you want to kill your bagworms, spray only where you saw your bagworms. And don't worry if a bird does pick off a bagworm that just munched on a BTK sprayed leaf and feeds it to their young, there's no danger and no harm. The BTK only harms and affects the caterpillars. And they do it when the caterpillars eat the sprayed leaves because it paralyzes the digestive tract. Happens, they stop eating. And when they stop eating, they die of starvation. It's not fast acting, so be patient and read the label recommendations for repeat applications. Now, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, comes in many varieties. BTK, BTI, BTA. There are several different strains, one for mosquito larva or wax moth larva or Japanese beetles or Colorado potato beetle, they will only work on the specific insect for which they were developed. So you can't use your BTK for Colorado potato beetle. You have to buy a specific one. So when you purchase your BT, check the ingredients and buy the correct variety and also make sure 
that you're not buying some jacked up brand that also has some kind of insecticide in it. So please read labels. So you remember that soil test you did in February? Well, these are your lab results. March is the time to start preparing your soil. Your soil test will show you what you need to add. The advantage of a soil test is that the recommendations can be specific to what you're growing in your landscape. When you fill out the testing request, you say what you're growing, a lawn, vegetables, flowers, fruit trees. You can be very specific and you can send in multiple samples, one for the front yard, one for the side yard, one for the backyard, et cetera. And in addition to getting this analysis, you also receive a description and an explanation of the different laboratory tests were performed. So if you look at this one on the right, you could see that the top half has a nice little visual to show you your main soil chem um, um, chemicals, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, and it'll show, is it low, is it medium, is it optimum? Over here, this person's magnesium is excessive. This person said their crop is flower beds. This person said they're growing pawpaw trees. And on the bottom, it tells you what the recommendation is, what to apply. And if it doesn't need anything, it'll tell you that. So this is what the soil test results look like. You should get it done every three or four years. And you'll save yourself from guessing. Like my husband gets the lawn done. And he said, the guy wants to know if you want to put down lime. I said, not in the backyard. He says, he didn't run no test. What do I need lime for? Well, the last time I tested, my lime was great. Maybe I'll get it done again this year, right? Right. Any questions on soil testing? Let's wrap up March. March is a very busy month and there's plenty still to do. Like starting your cool weather seeds indoors, your broccoli, your cabbage, your cauliflower, your leek, your parsley, which is slow to germinate and your lettuce. These are cool weather plants. And it's very easy to look up on the internet for cool weather vegetables and cool weather flowers. Okay. You can direct sow. That means right into the garden soil now, this in March, of course, not now because it's still January. The seeds of radish, spinach, turnip, pea, and onion sets. The flowers for bachelor button, zinnias, cosmos, ageritum, sunflowers, and sweet peas. The main concern at this point is not the weather, but the physical condition of the soil. You're not supposed to work in wet, damp soil. You compact it. It's just not the right environment for seeds that haven't spent the whole winter outside getting acclimated to the weather. So to test if the soil is ready, you grab a handful and you squeeze it into a ball. If it remains in a moist ball, it's still too wet to begin working, but it's perfect for pulling weeds and pull weeds all year long. If the ball crumbles when you touch it, it's ready to direct sow your cool weather crop. Winter freezing temperatures can also cause plants to heave up out of the soil, especially the ones that were newly planted last year. So during your walk, look for any plants that have heaved and during a mild stretch, it's been a couple of high 30s, 40s and the ground's not rock solid frozen, you can step on the plant, not step on the plant, but you can use your foot to press it back into the ground. If you have grapes, they should be pruned now 
back to a few major vines before they leaf out. If you prune grapes after they're leafed out, you'll just run the sap. And of course, because you prune them back to major, leaf, major stems now, that means the new fruit will be growing on the new vines that get grown during the spring. Your roses should be pruned also. Depending on the size of the bush and your own personal preference, roses can be pruned from anywhere between down to six to 18 inches. And you can continue to spray with horticultural oil and continue your pruning. But it's time to get your seeds and your supplies ready for starting your warm weather plants, such as your tomatoes and your peppers and your eggplant. And you can see from this arbor that how it's more convenient to do any work to it before anything has leafed out. You should be mulching your perennials with soft organic matter, but remember, do not cover any new growth with the mulch. And it is advisable not to use shredded bark or wood because as the wood breaks down and decomposes, it uses up the nitrogen in the soil and it might prevent your plants from growing their best. Also mulch those newly planted peas and onions that you planted in the garden and you can mulch them with shredded leaves and straw and pine needles. And no, the pine needles are not gonna leach a whole bunch of acid. That's already all gone out of them by the time they fall to the ground and then they get gathered up and put on your property. And remember, the mulch should not touch the seedlings. Also, it's time to evaluate your lawn. Reseed bare spots. Continue to pull overwintered weeds. Apply a pre-emergent for weeds and maybe core aerate if the ground is dry and leave any major renovations for August. And if you have any vining plants, now's the time to add the structures to them because it's heck of a job to do it when you get around to it and they're all sprawled around the, on the floor. And it's also a good time to paint and refurbish, build or repair any of your outdoor structures because you still have a little time before the real warm weather comes in and you get very busy. And then start preparing your beds for planting. Loosen the soil, add compost, remove weeds, and maybe buy a few extra bags of compost and save it for the fall. I bet you thought you'd see a big flowering forsythia. Forsythias are pretty, but you will never see a pollinator on it. So I included two nice native early blooming shrubs that will be a source of food for pollinators in early April. The spice bush, Lindera benzoin, and the lovely flame azalea, Rhododendron calendulaceum. They are uh, some sources of native plants noted in the handout. If you're interested in um, planting, do consider a native. They're much more hardier, they're adapted, and they attract the nice um, insects that are beneficial to our landscape. Here's another big topic, time to plant trees and shrubs. Take more time in deciding where to plant your tree or shrub than you actually do planting it. Let me repeat that one more time. Take more time in deciding where to plant your tree or shrub than you actually do planting it. How wide will it grow? How tall will it grow? If you want it near your property line, will it reach over and drop seeds and needles and leaves and branches on your neighbor's property when it gets big? If you plant it near your house, will you be able to squeeze between the plant and your house in seven years to do repairs? Does the plant prefer full sun or shade? 
sheltered, or exposed? When you have answered all these questions, then it's time to begin. Plant in early April before bud break because it minimizes the shock to the plant. Plant a hole wide enough to allow the roots to spread and as deep as the existing soil that's in the nursery pot. You can test this out by placing the pot in the hole to check that the depth is correct. The root collar, oh, here we got another collar here. The root collar, which is the point where the roots meet the trunk should be at ground level or maybe an inch above it. That will account for when the soil settles and the plant sinks a bit more in the ground, okay? So remove the tree or shrub from the pot or the burlap. And do not leave any burlap in the hole to decompose. Place only the plant in the hole. You could also follow these instructions for your bare root plants. Of course, minus any uh, mention of soil because they come bare, right? So you hold the tree or shrub over the hole so that the original soil falls in the hole. That's why, excuse me, falls in the hole. Now you loosen up the roots from the soil now that the plant is out of the pot. So you can flare the roots out in the hole and that's why you want the hole wide. But if your plants are wound around the nursery pot and you cannot flare them out because they spring back into a circle, bring the plant back and ask for another one. So this picture here on the top, it shows that this plant had to be dug up, it died and it had to be dug up. And when it was cut down, they looked at the roots and they saw that they looked exactly like what they did when they pulled it, when it was pulled out of its nursery pot and planted. These roots are girdled. That's what these are called, girdled. And girdling will eventually. Now, eventually is like maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, but it will eventually kill a tree about the time it gets expensive to remove it. Don't leave the nursery without asking to see the roots. Another way to prevent girdling is to not put any, and I'm going to do air quotes, good soil or compost in the planting hole. Just use the soil from the hole you dug and the soil from the nursery pot. I know a lot of people used to say you have to amend the soil, put some compost in the hole. Well, what that does is, yes, the tree's not gonna complain. Oh, I love this new compost and this good soil they put in here. But as the tree starts to push out the new roots, the new roots will eventually hit your landscape soil. It's compacted, it may contain shale or rocks, it may be clay, and it's gonna say, I can't push through this. I've got all this great soil here. So I'm gonna make a left and see if there's, if I could move, you know, grow out further. And it's never gonna grow out it's just going to keep going left, 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 or right, 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 right. And you're going to end up girdling the plant yourself. So do not put anything in the hole except for the native soil that's in your landscape and the soil from the pot itself. And place your tree in the hole and make sure that the root collar is slightly above the soil level of your landscape. What I like to do is lay a rake across the hole to make sure that the root stem collar is not above or below the rake handle. Then you begin filling it in with the soil you dug out. You break up any clumps and add some water halfway through because this helps to settle the soil. You keep checking that your tree is standing straight up and add enough soil to come to the bottom of the root trunk collar. Then 
Use your feet to stamp down the soil and be careful not to rub against the plant. You add a little more soil if needed, but don't mound any soil up against the trunk. You make sure that the plant has been planted securely by giving it a little tug. Don't try to pull it out of the ground because you will. Just give it a nice little tug. Then you finish up with a little circle of mulch around the plant, ensuring that the mulch does not touch the stems or the trunk. Early April, it is the time to start your warm weather seeds indoors. So your indoor seed starting starts in early April and you're planting your warm weather plants such as tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, melons, cucumbers, and squash. Why? Because they're not going to go into the ground until the middle to late April, weather permitting. Remember that basket of kittens and puppies. Don't plant more than you can transplant into larger pots and have room for them under your grow lights. You know, you had a nice tight little um, uh, formation of seedling trays under your grow lights. Now picture how crowded it's going to be when you put them into their transplant pots. All these seeds also need to be hardened off and that means carrying them all outside and bringing them all back in in a couple of hours, you know, before it gets cold again at night. If you tried and planted any um, uh, outdoor winter sown plastic jug containers, you've got to be checking on them from time to time. At this time of year, they will certainly need more light, air, room, and repot any seedlings that have two sets of true leaves or more, and then put them in a spot in your backyard where it's convenient for you to look after them because they're gonna need more water. Now, if you look at the plant in the little red container at the bottom, that's a tomato. The first leaves that come up are not leaves. That's just the seed hole. It's called a cotyledon. That's not leaves. What comes after the first leaf or leaves that come out the ones that come after them are the true leaves. Wait till you have two sets of true leaves before you do any repotting, okay? Now, in the garden, you should plant and mulch the seedlings that you started in February and March. Remember in February, March, you started some broccoli and cabbage and cold weather crops. Now's the time to plant them and mulch them. You could also plant seeds this time of year in the ground. Beets, carrots, peas, dill, endive, escarole, kohlrabi, lettuce, parsnips, potatoes, radish, swishard. That's a pretty big list of seeds you could put in the ground now. And here's a nice hint. Most vegetables that can be direct planted in the ground in the spring can also be planted in August for a fall crop. And most of those, like the leafy ones, like the Swishard or the, or the Brussels sprouts, they could be left over winter if you cover them, you know, with a row cover. So you could have vegetables in the winter time now. So let's wrap up our April. Now your uh, spring bulbs, your daffodils and your tulips and such, you need to remove the spent flowers and their stems. You see over here, this little dying uh, uh, daffodil, you see the swollen ovary here? Well, that's because it was fertilized by a pollinator because you're lucky enough to have them in your yard. And if you leave, you just pick off that little deadhead and you leave that stem with that ovary, that plant is gonna put a lot of its energy into maturing the seeds. It's what they do. So remove the stem and the flower, but leave the leaves because you know they're needed to fix the energy, photosynthesis, into the bulb for next year's flower. When they get all crispy, you could remove them. If you have perennials and they're overgrown, 
now's the time to divide them. If you have flowering tree, flowering shrubs, you can deadhead them. But again, as I mentioned, be careful not to cut off the bud for next year's flower. Start planting your outside containers, your decorative containers. Now's the time to do that. And here's a little cheat here. Let's say you like to plant early, but you really don't want to go through the hassle of starting seeds and all that. You can take a shortcut by purchasing seedlings from the big box stores. Why? Because they always sell them way too early before it's warm enough to put them out into the ground. Try putting them under grow lights, then repotting them and then hardening off and then putting them in the ground. Okay, Rebecca, I am gonna interrupt with one question because I'm not quite sure. It may need some clarification, but it must be referring to something you just said. It says if you leave it, then they will double in number, right? Um, Karen, you may need to clarify that question. The daffodils, oh, okay. So oh yes, I, um, okay, here, this is again, like we said, your vision of a landscape, if it's a little patch of daffodils where that's where the daffodils grow, then you need to keep your eye on it. Get out your garden log and say, in 2021, the daffodils got way too, they're spreading too much. Dig them up when it's appropriate and move them or give them away. Otherwise, when you take off the stem and you leave the leaves and they they flourish, they, they'll, they'll divide by themselves, they'll get all nice and crowded by themselves. You could just leave them alone. I mean, there's a beautiful spot in Central Park where nobody ever touches the daffodils. They just, they just sprawl. So it's how much control do you want? If you want to exercise control over your plants, then yes, you will dig them up, move them someplace else, throw them away, give them away. Okay, and here's a quick mention. If you want to start composting, try a three bin compost system because it allows you to make compost faster than a single bin or even just a single pile. I have a reference to it in the uh, handout. Yes, there's some building involved, but there's also a little reading that explains why it's faster. So if you really want to have some compost, try the three bin system, or you can buy it. And now we end with November and December. Winter preparation for spring 2022. Water your trees in November now, November and December. Water your trees and shrubs well before the ground freezes and before you turn off your outside hoses for the winter time. Don't cut away dead perennials. The birds will eat the remaining seeds and insects will overwinter in their stems. They serve to remind us where our plants are so we can avoid walking on them. Clean out your vegetable beds. This is where you get rid of everything. Clean out your vegetable beds and add layers of compost and chopped leaves. And you top it off with a layer of straw. Mow over your leaves with the bagger attachment. And if you don't have a bagger attachment, you get some nice exercise using a rake. Use them as a layer in your cleaned out vegetable garden, in your flower beds, or pile them up to use next spring as soft mulch. And don't be afraid what your neighbors are gonna say. It's the winter time, nobody's really looking at your backyard. And by the time the spring comes, it'll be all flattened out. Nobody will even see it. Avoid using whole leaves because they stick together and they get soggy and they are very slow to decompose. So you're just gonna have a pile of whole leaves come the springtime. This is another universal 
clean up any debris lying around your fruit trees and throw it out. You should do this periodically throughout the whole year. And finally, clear the landscape of any fallen plant material and twigs and pile it up in a corner of your property. It will begin to decompose and flatten by next summer. But over the winter, the birds and the insects will take shelter in it. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed the talk. Any photos, tools, products used in my presentation is just for the purpose to illustrate what's available and does not mean that is being endorsed by the master gardeners. And also the master gardeners adhere to the non-discrimination law set out by the federal government.